We are joined now by Virginia Attorney General Jason Miares, who is in the process of uh, filing a lawsuit against the NCAA and has a big video out about that. We'll talk about that in a sec, but I just wanted to kind of start here. Uh, Mr. Attorney General, appreciate you uh, you making the time to join us here on Clay and Buck. How much in play do you think the state of Virginia is based on what you are seeing on the ground and coming off of the Glenn Young can win that, that ushered in your entire regime? How much is Virginia, in your mind, a swing state? Is it winnable given all the third-party machinations and everything else that are going on there? Because if it were, basically Trump would be the the the, the president, right? If Virginia were to flip, it's one of those that, Repu- that Democrats could not recover from. Well, let's put it this way: in 2021, when when you know Glenn and I we we won in 21, Joe Biden's approval rating in Virginia on election right before election day was about 49 percent. We ran a one or two points ahead. Uh, Biden's approval rating in Virginia right now is in the low 40s. It's it's actually a better political climate right now for Republicans in general because he has so utterly failed at I think one of the most fundamental uh, tasks with any elected official, which is keeping our keeping your people safe, keeping your citizens safe. It has been an utter, complete, unmitigated disaster at the border. To just give you things in perspective, uh, in the last year, we've caught 150 members of the on the fiscal year 2023 on the terrorist watch list, the FBI terrorist watch list. If you want to get an idea of how many are getting through that we don't know where they are now, multiply that number by four. By comparison, in the year 2020, what was caught and apprehended by the terrorist watch list at the border was six. We went from six to 150, and that gives you an idea from from an attorney general's perspective. The what is happening at the border is the, one of the single greatest national security threat in our nation. Uh, the fact that you have federal agents now blowing the whistle and saying we now have thousands of military age males that have come to our country that we simply don't know where they are because what happens is you get caught at the border, you get the equivalent of a parking ticket that says, we'll see you in court in four years, in 2028 or 2029. And that's what 83% of those that are stopped at the border get, is essentially they say they they get trained to say, I'll seek asylum. They get a court date four or five years from now, and they leave. And there's over a 90% uh, of scon rate of people that don't have a bother to show up in court. So, yeah, I can go off on the border all day because it is unconscionable. uh, what is happening. And I think as a result, it has put every board, every state is a border state. And I think it's putting states in play that maybe some people were surprised at. Attorney General Miares, thanks for being here with us. Uh, can you give us a sense as to what the uh, budgetary impact may be from all the illegals in Virginia, if you have any sense of those numbers or statistics? And, and also, in terms of the uh, incarcerated population at the state level, does Virginia keep clear numbers on how many of them are illegals? Well, our problem is the federal government isn't telling us what, what, where they're uh, shipping them. I'll give you an example. In Culpeper in Virginia, we now have over 20 missing minor children that have gone missing. That what happens is the federal government, through the Office of Refugee Resettlement, will take them into a state, not tell anybody in local law enforcement, not tell anybody in state uh, what's happening, and then they'll just leave them with certain individuals that, as you know, the local cops are usually the ones that could figure out, you know, what are the safe areas, what are the unsafe areas, who are the people you could trust, who are the people that, that have a reputation of nefariousness in the community. And obviously it's been a haven for human trafficking. So now you have, um, you know, over 20 individuals that are uh, 21 minors. We have 80,000 nationally minor children that the federal government has lost track of. Uh, I think this is one of the most uh, astonishing stories of incompetency at the federal level that we've ever seen. We have 80,000 migrant children that that were placed in different states, never notifying local law enforcement or state authorities, that now they don't know where they are. (laughs) It is one of the great scandals of our time. And, uh, you know, we, we do see the crime. We had a tragedy of a minor of an illegal immigrant from Venezuela who's charged with sexual assault of a minor outside of Lynchburg and Campbell County. We had a missing team in Ohio that ended up outside of Bedford. Uh, And and we're seeing stories after stories like this happening. Um, And when I say that every state's a border state, it's absolutely impacting uh, what's happening. I'll give you an example. I was looking to do an anti-gang kind of town hall in Northern Virginia at a a Latino church in Northern Virginia. And our office reached out, and the pastor 
said, listen, keep up the good work, keep up what you're doing in this front. I don't feel safe uh, hosting this because of retaliation. And so we, people hear about the word privilege. Privilege are, are these uh, so many of these left-wing uh, activists and liberals that vote for policies that don't actually impact their community. They're not looking over their shoulder in fear. It's happening in a lot of other areas. And so it is something a great concern for me. Uh, you know, people ask me sometimes, what kind of the last name is Miares? And I like to say it's Southern, it's Deep South, it's Cuban. But but so much of what's <laughs> happening with the uh, with the illegal illegal immigration is affecting the Latino communities as well. Part of the reason why you're seeing the Hispanic uh, and Latino population shifting towards the GOP is they know that 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 one party is serious about about safety in their neighborhoods and, and border security, and one party is not. And I think it's a it's a great split. We're talking to Attorney General Jason Miares from uh, uh, from the great state of Virginia. So I, I want to just ask one more question, then we'll circle back on this uh, NCAA tournament thing, because I do think it's so interesting. What was your reaction when you saw MSNBC, when you saw Rachel Maddow, and you saw uh, uh, Jen Psaki making a joke about the fact that it was motivating many voters in Virginia right. to vote based on immigration. And they said, right. well, it does share a border with West Virginia. Ha, 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 ha. Um, as, as someone who is in charge with uh, <laughs> enforcing the law, what was your reaction when you saw that clip go viral? Uh, I thought, and that was sent to me on election night, I thought that 60-second clip did more to show how out of touch the media elites and the legacy media is, particularly on this issue, on, on so many issues with everyday Americans. And they were mocking the fact that exit polls of the Virginia Republican primary had that immigration and, and border security was the number one issue for, that motivated Republican primary voters in Virginia. And what they fail to realize is it's not only the number one issue for Republicans, it's the number one issue by polling by Americans across the nation. And the fact that they would get on the MSNBC and, and openly mock and deride uh, deride the views of everyday voters, I think just was encapsulated just how out of touch these, these the legacy media outlets are when they're stuck in their bubble in Washington, D.C. or New York or L.A., and they're not talking to everyday Americans, and they just deride it as, as, and, and dismiss it out of hand, and it's, it's, it really is more a reflection on them than it is on us. I'll tell you that right now. Clay, I'm going to let you take it away with this name and likeness stuff because yeah. I'm I'm a novice when it comes to NCAA name and likeness. So you uh, you get to shoot the three on this one. Go for it. Uh, all right. So you put up a video. We shared it at Outkick. I shared it on my account. You have filed a lawsuit alongside of uh, Jonathan Scarmetti, who is the Attorney General of Tennessee, against the NCAA. Obviously, many of our listeners, I would say probably a huge majority, are going to be watching games. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. What is the NCAA doing that, in your mind, is an antitrust violation? And I thought it was really interesting. Historically, you tied this into Teddy Roosevelt and what he did uh, as it right. pertained to college athletics, uh, you know, 100-some-odd years ago. Right. Uh, for our audience that might be like Buck and not really paying attention to the <laughs> NIL uh, situation, which I think there's a lot of people who, who, who aren't paying attention, but I right. think they would agree with a lot of the arguments that you're making. Explain right. why it matters and why people should care. Well, I give Buck a lot more credit maybe than you, but um, I would say Thank you. The, NCAA, <laughs> the NCAA, first of all, it's a cartel. That's the first thing you have to understand. It is an anti-competitive cartel. Uh, the NCAA signed just a couple years ago a $6 billion, billion with a B, television contract just for the men's basketball tournament. And how much of that money actually went to the players? Zero dollars. Um, while the, the head of the NCAA makes millions of dollars, the players get nothing. And I just view that as anti, anti-American, right? If I was a computer science major at Virginia Tech or if I was at some other school in Amazon or somebody wanted to pay me for my talent, uh, I could be rewarded for that. The only people on a college campus that can't be rewarded for their talent are these, are these athletes that are generating millions upon millions, if not billions of dollars for the NCAA and for a lot of these schools. And they never see any, never see any of it. So, a couple years ago, people took him to court, went all the way to the uh, Supreme Court, and the NCAA smacked, got smacked down by the Supreme Court, um, in which Justin Kavanaugh pointed out, listen, you never got an a, uh, antitrust waiver by Congress. You were the definition of a violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act, where you are basically colluding in an anti-competitive manner from people being benefited and rewarded for the talents. And, and just for your listeners, I know there's probably a lot of your listeners thinking, well, these players do – 
they get college scholarships, don't they? They do. But I had a former ACC quarterback share with me. He said, you know, I took the value of my tuition and I divided it by the number of hours that I spent in the weight room, in the film room, on the practice field, traveling to and from game day and game day. And the value of my tuition was less than half of minimum wage. And um, and a lot of these players, they never sniff the pros, but they deal with the physical injuries. I have two senior members of my staff uh, that played college ball. And they're at an age now, they're in their 40s, shoulder and back and knee injuries. They never sniff the pros. And my attitude is, when you get that four-year window where you can maximize the return, where you can actually be rewarded with your talent, how in the world are we denying them the ability of being rewarded for their talent? That's just the basic un-American anti-freedom of contract issue. And um, so I, I think the NCAA has been doing wrong by our player. They've been exploiting it for too long. Uh, it's something I've been passionate about. And so I was, I'm really proud to team up with Jonathan Scametti, the great attorney general in Tennessee, on taking this big issue on. Because I think it's been going, it's been a, it's been going on for too long, and we're happy to stand with the student athlete. Attorney General Miares of Virginia, sir, appreciate it. Uh, thanks so much for being here with us. Always a joy. Great fan of the show. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Keep up the good work, by the way. Virginia Cavaliers. Eh, uh, yesterday. One, uh, hey, did you watch that game? I'm a, I did, but I'm a JMU grad, so we got the Dukes coming up against Wisconsin, and maybe in the second round we'll get the Dukes versus Dukes. So we'll see. We'll see Good luck. Happens. JMU's been on a tear with their athletics yeah. program of late. Yep. Amen. Thanks, Clay. Appreciate it. Yeah, I, I Clay, I got to say, uh, the the case being made over name and likeness, I find it uh, personally very compelling. So I'm. It's think- really very fascinating because college athletics are changing in a massive way in a rapid fashion. And I think a lot of people kind of fill out of sorts a bit, but this lawsuit, I agree with. It's. Uh, they're really operating like some of these sports operate as this is from an outsider's perspective, but without the emotional attachments to college athletics, they're like minor league franchises, basically Mm -hmm. using university facilities and campuses, benefiting the university and the campus financially, not the players. But then it also gets into this, like if you're being recruited to play basketball at this or that school, are you really a student athlete or are you an athlete student? As in, are you a professional athlete who is taking classes on the side? Maybe there should be more honesty about that as well. I have some uh, very, I would argue, sane, but probably unpopular views on all of these things. So we will uh, we'll continue to watch this one very closely. And now on to the Preborn Network of Clinics. My friends, this is such an important mission. The Preborn Network of Clinics are the nation's leader in introducing mothers with unplanned pregnancies to their babies. They do that by offering free ultrasounds to women who are visiting their clinics. Because once a mom hears that heartbeat and sees that precious life growing inside of her on that ultrasound machine, she's twice as likely to choose life. Preborn is a nonprofit that has clinics nationwide, and they're often in communities where abortion rates are tragically the highest. They don't receive any preborn government funding. It's only from you, the pro life community, and your donations that they're able to save lives. By your donations, Preborn has rescued over 280,000 babies. And they don't stop there. They provide love, support, and counseling for up to two years for free when mothers give birth to their babies. One ultrasound is just $28. $28. $140. And remember, this is a tax, tax deductible donation. $140 would help to rescue five babies' lives. So please, if you can, make a donation today. Dial pound 250 on your cell phone and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250, say baby, or go to preborn.com slash buck. That's preborn.com slash B-U-C-K. Sponsored by Preborn. 